हेलो एवरी वन एंड वेलकम बैक टू माई चैनल आई होप यू ऑल आर डूइंग गुड एंड स्टेइंग सेफ इन दीज चैलेंजिंग टाइम्स इन द लास्ट लेक्चर वी हैड स्टार्टेड आर डिस्कशन ऑन हाउ वी कैन राइट इम्प्लीसिट सॉल्वर्स इन ऑर्डर टू सॉल्व द प्रॉब्लम्स ऑफ इन द फील्ड ऑफ कंप्यूटेशनल फ्लूड डायनेमिक्स एज वेल एज कंप्यूटेशनल हीट ट्रांसफर सो आई हैड स्टार्टेड अ डिस्कशन अबाउट अ प्योर डिफ्यूजन प्रॉब्लम इन वन डे and we had looked at how we can formulate the matrix systems that are usually employed in the implicit solvers so if you haven't uh, watched that video i would highly recommend that uh, the link would be somewhere around here because without that discussion you won't really get the essence of what we are going to do today which is to look at the matlab script in order to solve these kind of problems and in case if you are interested in uh, solving such sort of problems or sort of cfd problems using python I am currently running a members only course uh, at the uh, at the membership zone of my channel which uh, you can get the access to by clicking on the join button and uh, that would allow you to access all the lectures that we are currently being working on towards solving cfd problems using python so in the lecture today we are going to have a discussion about how we can write a matlab code that solves the 1d pure diffusion problem using the implicit scheme so i'll just briefly walk you through what we did last time and will actually we need will actually be needing that kind of information in order to look at the code as well so uh before you proceed please go to that lecture because otherwise it would be really hard so without wasting any further time let's get started so in the last lecture we had looked at uh, this particular setup that if we have five grid points where the two points are near the boundary which we called at the boundary points that is t1 and t5 and then based on these five points or based on any number of points actually we can formulate a equation uh, or the set of equations which we can mold in a matrix form as ct equals to d so here the c was a coefficient matrix which comes out of this form the t is the temperature unknown matrix and the d is the source matrix so now we want to see how to write these particular matrices in matlab and further how to solve that so let us first start by looking at the general basics of how to initialize your particular problem because the first step is to define the problem parameters and to sort of set up the problem so we'll first look at that so if i go to my editor where i've already written the code and you might have observed that typically i start my codes with this general practice of writing clear close and the cleaning of the command window so after that we want to get all the inputs so we have the total number of grid points which i'm taking as 5 here just because we can have a one on one correspondence between the code as well as what we have looked at in the powerpoint then we can have a domain length which i'm taking as l equals to 0.5 and now based on both of these we can define the grid spacing that comes out to be l over n so you can cross check it whether this is correct or not now if we have the grid spacing and if we know where the or what the total domain length is we can have the uh, spatial location as well so this kind of spatial location might be needed for plotting the result if especially if you have exact solution or if you have want to compare the two so this is needed for that after that we take the thermal conductivity and area that is taken as k and a and this is the reason why i didn't write my matrix system as ax equals to b because that would coincide with this a variable that i have taken at area so if you remember we had the boundary conditions of 100 kelvin or 100 degrees at the left boundary and we have a temperature of 500 at the right boundary that i am representing by ta and tb so if i want to have these kind of uh, uh, matrix or rather arrays for the temperature we know that the first index that would correspond to the left boundary that would have a temperature of 100 whereas the last index that would correspond to a temperature of 500 so if you're not sure what i'm talking about when i'm saying index you might want to check out my previous videos in the matlab series where we actually look at what this indexing really is but basically this just corresponds to the address of the individual uh, elements in your vector so basically the first element that corresponds to the leftmost uh, 
data point and the right uh, the, or the last element that n corresponds to the rightmost element of your vector. So through this, we are able to define the initial conditions of the problem. So in order to formulate the matrix, the first important thing to know is that the matrix C, it was actually a 5 by 5 matrix. So therefore, I'm writing C of n comma n being 0. So this is just an initialization of the C matrix. And similarly, my D matrix, it's also initialized at 0. And we see that it's a column vector. So or in this case, I've written it like a row, row vector, but this would be taken care of later on. So in these two lines over here, I'm simply initializing those two variables as 0. Now comes the most important part where we want to feed in this information as to what is going on. So let us look at it one by one. So first of all, we know that these three equations in the center, they are for the interior points. The first equation is the, for the leftmost point and the last equation is for the rightmost point. And corresponding to this, we have to uh, define in the code that uh, how to tackle these kind of situations. So if I go back to my code here, so you see that I have a for loop that goes from 1 to n, that is from the first point all the way to the last point. And in this, I have three cases. The first case, if, if i is greater than 1 and less than n. So that corresponds to the case of all the interior points, because the interior points, the index of those, that would start from 2 and it would end at n minus 1. And the second case is, if the i is equals to 1, which corresponds to the left boundary. And the third case is taken care by this else statement that basically corresponds to the right boundary. So if you're not sure what's going on here, please check out the nesting nested statements for if, else if that is available on the MATLAB documentation for free. And from that, you would be able to understand what I'm doing here. And it is very fundamental and it is very useful when you want to write the solvers for CFD or CHD. So now let us look at it one by one. So let us for now start with the case of the left boundary because the left boundary is quite easy. So we see that for the left boundary, we have the first row and we have the first column that is AP and the second column as minus of AE. So that's what I would try to write in the solver now. So here I'm writing that C of I comma I. So I has taken the value of one so C of I comma I becomes the first row, first column. And that I'm defining as 3Ka by H. So now you might wonder that this was AP. But if you remember from the left boundary point, we had AP comes out as 3Ka by H. So that is what I'm trying to code over there. And similarly, the negative of AE would be minus Ka by H that I'm writing as c of i comma i plus one because this is first row and second column because i is equals to one and that is what i'm doing here and similarly if i look at my d vector we have su sitting here and then we have to scroll back to what the su was it was two times ka into ta by h so now if i write it here that i've written as two into ka by h into ta so i hope that these three lines are clear and in the exact same way we are writing for the right boundary so we have ap that is i comma i so ap is corresponding to i comma i which i should have explained first for the interior points so in the interior points you can see that i have used these comments to show that wherever we have i comma i that corresponds to ap wherever we have i and i minus one so minus one corresponds to the west grid point because it's lying behind the point P and I plus one. Similarly, that would correspond to our AE point. So that way we can have the same kind of expressions for the right boundary. And finally, for the interior points, we have three equations. So that is why the most number of cases would be handled by that. And therefore, we would have both or rather all of the AW, AP and AE in the system. So we have in this case, so this is the case for the interior grid points. So interior grid points, we have all of them. And the important thing is that the source term is zero. That is the value of DI is zero. So the DI is only non-zero for the boundary cases that are these two. 
I'm not sure how well I was able to explain this, but if you would look at the code here and if you would put your calculations by your side, I'm very sure that you would be able to have a very good one on one correspondence between these two. But if you just try to uh, eat your popcorn and then try to understand it, it might be a bit hard. So please try to derive the equations, try to look the matrix, try to write it by hand and then try to look at the code. I'm very sure that you would understand what I'm trying to say here. So now we have formulated the coefficient matrix C and the source matrix D. The last point or the last piece of the puzzle is to simply obtain the solution. And thanks to MATLAB, this is very simple. So in order to write the division of uh, the D matrix, which or D vector by the C matrix, we can use this. Uh, uh, there are actually multiple ways. So the way I, in which I prefer to do is we, we write this particular expression here. So here, this particular coefficient matrix is dividing the D prime vector. Because if you remember D, I had initialized it as a row vector, but originally it's a column vector. So I have to take a transpose of it and that is why I'm using a dash here. So once we do that, we get the temperature, uh, that is the final value of temperature. And this is where the key differences between the implicit and explicit schemes are. In the explicit schemes, we have to keep iterating until we achieve certain numerical error threshold. But in the implicit schemes, we just have to take one giant step in order to achieve at the final solution. So this is the fundamental difference between the two schemes as well. So after obtaining the solution, we look at how the result is looking out. So we look at the plots. So in order to plot, what we can do is we can firstly look at the spatial location of the grid points. So this grid points is important because previously we had looked at the spatial location of very general kind of system. But because we know that the kind of grid, if you remember that we had designed the first point, it was not on the boundary. So the first point is not x equals to zero. It is rather h by two if it's a uniform grid. So the first spatial location, it starts from h by two. It takes a spacing of h and it goes all the way up to n times h. So that is the x location of all the grid points. And then I can plot the x location on the x axis, the temperature on the y axis, and I can do some funny playing around with the uh, visualization aspect. So I'm just saying that put a red uh, marker that has a red circular marker, and I don't really want any line that is going on. So the marker has a line width of one, but I'm not plotting any line uh, in order to fill in the solution. And um, what I'm also doing is I'm saying that you plot zero comma L that is the leftmost point and the rightmost point and put the values of temperature as TA and TB. Because in this particular kind of system, we don't have grid points here. So we have to plot them manually. So in order to, to do that, we write this particular equation here. And because I've used a hold on statement, so they would not overwrite each other and they would be plotted at the same figure. So I'm using a black colored marker here so that you can actually see the boundary points as well. And then I do a very simple labeling of the figures using X label and Y label. And I, finally, I set the interpreter to LaTeX. So I typically like this whenever you want to push it into publication aspects. That is where you use the LaTeX interpreter generally. And to make the things a little bit more elegant, we use a Y ticks of 100 to 500 because we know that is where the solution would vary. So now if I run the code, we would see that we get a solution of temperature versus X where the red points corresponds to the interior and the boundary grid points. The black points are exactly the boundary conditions and we ex or we ex as expected, we get a linear solution in the domain. So I hope that this would be able to give you certain idea as to how to write your implicit solvers. I wouldn't uh, go into much more detail than this because this is what I think was the best possible explanation from my end for this particular problem. But I would encourage you to write the code and try to then look at the C matrix, how it looks like and what the other parameters are. And you can try changing the grid points. You can try changing the boundary conditions and see if you still observe the same behavior. I'm sure you would do that. So this would be all for the discussion regarding to the steady 1D diffusion problem without the source. So in the next part of this lecture series or rather mini lecture series, we would also include a source term in this equation. 
and then see how the problem or the physics of the problem would be changed because of the inclusion of the source term. So I hope you stay tuned until here. If these kind of lectures are helping you out, please consider su uh, supporting this channel through the link that is currently being shown on the screen. Every little help, it means a lot to me and it keeps me very encouraged and inspired to keep producing these kind of videos for you. I hope until the next videos, you take care of yourself and you stay safe with all your loved ones. In the next lecture, we would look at a little bit more advanced problem. Until then, I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.